Okay. Far away, people. Warm up. All shy. There's nobody coming along and don't want to say anything. <laughs> Face your fear and go ahead. Good on you. There's a mic right by you. It's freaking me out being recorded. <laughs> um, last time I was at the workshop, I spoke to you about my chronic fatigue and my hook into people um, needing their approval. Um, and how much you're desiring, you're, you're willing to sacrifice your entire life almost for their approval. Well, I have in the past. Of course you have, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, now I sort of feel like I'm being physically attacked sometimes by spirits because I have days when I just deteriorate so dramatically yep. and so quickly. Yep. It's scaring me. Sure. Um, but I, I'm confused what the hook is into them. Like, what do they get from me? Okay, well, let's, uh, so let's draw what's happening for you. How's that? So here's Elvira. Sorry about the dress, Elvira. All right. You, because of a certain emotional condition, so if you imagine if you had no emotional injuries at all, what would happen is you would have a nice, smooth, what people call an aura, but it's really actually a, a smooth, protective barrier around yourself. So no person would be able to hook into any emotion that you have and draw from you, and you wouldn't be able to hook into anyone else's emotion either or draw from them in that state because you'd, you'd all, all also be loving. Right? Now, as soon as you have an emotional injury, then there's a crack or a hole in that aura or that field, if you like, of protect, protection around yourself. And the more emotional injuries we have the more cracks there are, if you like, in to ourself. So, so you can imagine it like these are sort of like almost energy vortexes now, and that's how they actually look to the spirits. There's energy vortexes that through those cracks enter certain parts of our body. Does that make sense? And any spirit or any person, so it doesn't matter whether the person's in the spirit world, right? or on earth, so if they're here on earth next to you, they can draw from energy from you as a result of those cracks. So, so what's happening for yourself quite frequently now is that you're trying to see, oh, well, I've got, I've got something going on with this person on earth and I've got something going on with that person on earth and you're trying to at least address some of those things that you've got going on with the people on earth. But the problem is there's all these spirits that surround you. And these spirits also know every one of those cracks. Right? And they will attempt to draw your energy from you wherever they can. That's their desire. And their desires are all based around what they want out of the interaction. And then your allowance of it is about what you want from the interaction or what you allow from the interaction. You see, a lot of times we don't want something specifically, but we, we, we feel like we have to give it. So something that's happened in your life a lot, for example, with women, is that you feel like you've got to do things for them no matter what they're demanding from you. So that's a, one of the emotional holes, if you like. So if I was a woman in the spirit world, I would see that hole and I'd go, all I've got to do is pressurise Elvira a bit and she'll automatically allow me to draw from her emotionally. Right? What, what emotion do they get from <coughs> me? Like, I don't understand. That, that has always confused me about what it is that spirits can conceivably get. Well, one emotion they get from you is your fear. In other words... They can project something at you, like nast be nasty towards you, and they feel you go afraid, and they like that. Because what that does is it gives them a, a feeling that they're more powerful than you. Does that make sense? It gives them a feeling that they're in control of you. So, so, one, so some of the spirits who are around you are addicted to your fear. They like seeing you afraid. They like seeing you feel like scared for your life, in fact. 
right? And if you think about the last few weeks in particular, you can feel some of that fear. When you start getting quite ill, you can feel that almost that fear for your life almost kicking in as well. And that's what they love to see happen to you. They love you being afraid for your life. It makes them feel powerful and in control of you. And, and, and some of them laugh at that and some of them are condescending towards that. Others are actually just quite vicious and they just like to have that feeling of power over you. Does that make sense? So I need to go into the fear of that. The fear that you might die, that is one of the fears they're playing upon. Does that make sense? Um, the fear, uh, the, you have a number of other fears. Fears about embracing a desirous life, a, a life of desire. Does that make sense? So you, you think back and you over your life, every time desire has come along, you've almost been in two minds. Like, because, or if I could say it more like, like what it really is, you really have two feelings that are almost opposing each other. One is, I would love to follow that desire. The other is, I'm scared as hell about that desire, you know, like about following that desire and what, where that's going to lead me. And so what they do is they manipulate you through your fear. So fear is a big part of what they're doing with you. They cause you to become so afraid that, uh, that you're willing to give to them yourself almost, energy-wise, you're willing to give yourself to them uh, just to prevent their fear, pre sorry, prevent their rage towards you or, or, or their anger towards you. And it is, it's the resistance to feeling that fear that is allowing them to draw the energy from you. So when you soften into the fear and you just let yourself feel how terrified you are that they're going to attack you and harm you or, or reject you heavily, like a lot of the approval addiction is about just avoiding the horrible ostracism that you, you fear, if you can soften into the fear, then it feels scary, but you'll still have your energy. Yeah. It's the resistance to the fear that's causing the... So the key thing to remember is that every time you resist the actual fear emotion, which is something that you've done most of your life, if you, and you began to do it, you were taught how to do it uh, from your childhood, but you've been doing it most of your life now. So it's a, it's a pattern that, that has been built up over your life. And as you... Um, start stepping into your fear, you'll find spirits and others can hurt you less, actually. Most of us are afraid that with fear, if we step into our fear, people are about to harm us more, right? So most of us think that we're going to get harmed more, we'll be more open and more vulnerable and more, and all these things. So we worry so much about that, that we resist our fears. But the irony is that when you feel your fear, the hole that allows somebody else to control your fear gets patched up. Does that make sense? So, so when you feel your own fear, the, the irony is the hole that allows somebody else to control your fear is no longer present in that moment. And so in that moment, you can no longer be influenced by the external person. It, it's, ha it's about having a loyalty to the truth in a lot of ways. Like Once we have this loyalty to the truth, where fear does not become the dominant thing controlling our lives anymore. And what's happening for yourself is that fear is quite a dominant part of control, and so that's open. And now anybody who, who basically... All, to control you, all somebody really needs to do is tell you that you're a bad person that you've you know, done bad things in your life and you should be ashamed of yourself and a few other things like that, or even, even just even um, like less blunt than that, in this interaction you're not being nice to me and all of a sudden you will feel like you've done the wrong thing and have to be nice. Does that make sense? Like, so, so because of that, they're sort of manipulating the fear that you have of being disapproved of and they're manipulating that through that opening and now... They really have control. All they've got to do is make a few suggestions to you that you're bad and you're this and you're that. And all of a sudden you'll try harder, give more, which is what the problem is. You, this is what causes the chronic fatigue, is the desire to give more and more and more and more to placate the fear that's, that you can't feel inside of yourself. Um, I've been like crying and shaking now since I started watching your videos. Yeah. Have I been just doing... Capping emotions or 
Well, the other problem you face, Elvira, and, and it's going to take a little bit of time for you to work through this, is you also have surrounding you a group of women spirits right, who are very, very afraid. And they feel your fear as, and they commiserate with it. In other words, they feel like, don't you go and feel your fear. We've got to try and get away from our fear. We've got to do whatever we can to help you avoid your fear and so forth and so forth. But a lot of times when you start processing, you actually, because of this willingness to feel other people's emotions that you have quite strongly, you're allowing them to process through you. Right? And as a result of that, they get to feel some of their fear through you. And they get to feel some of their grief through you. And this is because there's very, at the moment, it's very hard for you to determine what is the, the end of you and what's the beginning of another person. Does that make sense? Um, they almost feel, at the moment, like they're you, even. They, that, that's how close they are to you. They almost feel like they are you. And so a lot of times you are very willing to feel their emotions, but also avoiding your own in that moment. So you'll be crying, but actually, and, and to be frank, many people are doing this still. They're crying, but they're actually crying somebody else's emotion or in commiseration with somebody else's emotion. They're not actually crying their own life. They're, they're actually feeling about another person's life. Can I add to that mm. just about processing fear? Because uh, I've uh, put a lot of focus on that in the last few months. And I found that um, stepping into desire and action, taking action, uh, not, not in the sense of like, OK, I'm afraid of heights, I'm going to jump out of an aeroplane. No, first connect to what is my desire? What do I feel the truth is in this situation? Now, I'm going to stay true to that. and and step into whatever this experience is, like this interaction but with me and another person. And that is the time when I've released the most fear and been triggered, and I've had to leave the interaction sometimes and go and process. But I feel that the danger of processing fear um, when we're not challenging our desires or our actions, because that's the thing that limits our actions and desires, is fear. When we're not stepping into that, just even just focusing on this, I'm going to take a new action or I'm going to step into this desire, that can trigger our fear much more than just sort of sitting going, OK, I'm afraid of other people, I'll just feel that. <coughs> if it's not changing in my interactions with other people, I know I'm not, I'm not releasing the fear because immediately that I start releasing <coughs> the fear of other people, uh, my interactions with other people will change. But also, my experience is when I step into more interactions with people, First, recognising what is the truth, what is my addiction, how am I going to challenge this, then step into the interaction. My fears have been challenged and released far more rapidly. Does that make sense? Um, can you, would you mind giving an example of something that you've done recently? Because I always understand best when somebody... Sure. Yep. So I've got a lot of terror about spirits. And so I started running the mediumship team in God's Way of Love organisation that we've just launched. And um, there's a number of people in that team who have been very spirit influenced in the past and very attacking as a result towards myself and AJ. And at the opening of the first meeting, I said, guys, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the fact that spirit influence can happen um, and how we're going to deal with it. How, how, as a team, can we make sure that we don't make this a uh, venue, if you like, for spirits to influence all of us into other interactions that aren't authentic. And so we agreed that we would ask the person who's spirit influenced, give them the truth and ask them to leave, and they could come back at a time when, um, when they weren't so overcloaked. By the end of the first meeting, someone with some spirits who very violently uh, opposed to myself and AJ, specifically myself, um, Someone became very influenced by them, and I, I felt I could feel my fear. Um, and I thought, if I, don't, if I don't submit to this fear in my interaction with this person, I'm going to get resistive, or I'm going to get angry with them and try and shut them down. So because I wanted to stay in, the tr like in a loving space with this whole group, I went, I, I'm going to have to soften into this fear. And I stood and shook and talked to the person about what I could feel was happening, um, and we spoke at length. And eventually, he couldn't see what was happening. 
Uh, so eventually I had to ask him to leave and he was very angry with me. But during the whole process, I remained connected to myself because this is the beautiful thing about when we soften into our fear. We stay in connection with ourselves. We know what is loving in that space, even if we might be shaking. And so I shook <laughs> and asked him to leave. And, and since then, I feel less fear of those kind of interactions. But I had to challenge it in the moment. For yourself, Vera, um, <coughs> anger is the, it is the result of the underlying fear not being felt. So whenever you feel frustrated or angry, it's because you're not allowing yourself to feel the underlying fear. So if, if you, if sort of in that way, anger is your guide into what you're avoiding. So you, you know straight away if, if any time you feel just a moment or a tinge even of frustration, whatever it's about. It might even be about the fact that you're feeling ill, right? And you feel quite angry that you're feeling sick. Um, allow yourself to realise, yeah, actually, this is covering over my fear about feeling sick. Does that make sense? And allow yourself to go into that fear and feel that fear instead of trying to avoid it through anger or avoid it by doing. So you'll do usually one of two different things. When somebody projects at you, I want you to do what I want, You'll either do what they want, which is a way of avoiding your terror of them when you don't do what they want, or you'll go in and feel, you'll feel quite ill. You'll cre actually create more physical ailment within yourself as a way of excusing yourself from doing what they want. Does that make sense? So the, the creation of the sickness is actually helping you avoid what they're projecting at you without actually having to say to them, you're actually wanting me to do something and no, I'm not going to. You, you can now say to them, um, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't help you because I'm feeling sick and I really need to rest. Does that make sense? It's a way of actually avoiding the confrontation emotion. So, so the way the spirits around you and people around you manipulate you is they project the rage, if you like, to you, or uh, to be more honest, it's the threat of rage to you. So in other words, you're very, very sensitive to people who potentially be, could become rageful with you. So they, most of the time they don't because you're already doing what they want. Does that make sense to you? So because you're already doing what they want, they're not going to get into rage with you. What you're scared of is stopping doing what they want and then they'll get into a rage with you. And the way to avoid that then is to have actually an illness where you go, oh, I'm, I'm too sick to do what you want. You follow me? And, and it's a great way of actually not having to confront their rage because they at least might have some uh, compassion for your sickness and, and therefore not be angry with you for not doing what they wanted you to do in the first place. Now, in terms of the original question you asked was the codependency. The, in other words, what are you addicted to getting from them? Right? Well, firstly, what you're doing is you're addicted to preventing their potential anger. Does that make sense? How does it feel when somebody's angry with you? Um, my dad scared the crap out of me. Yeah, yeah. And how do you feel about yourself when they're angry with you? Helpless. Yep. And if you allow yourself to settle even further down, you'll find actually there's quite a few emotions in how you feel when they're angry with you. The terrible feelings inside of yourself about yourself. Like you almost blame yourself for another person's anger with you. Yeah, I couldn't. I wasn't good enough to stop it. Yeah. So, so, so in other words, this person who is potentially, so I probably should write that there, potentially in a rage with you. In other words, they have this underlying soul condition where they could easily get into a rage with you if you didn't give them what they wanted. Right? And there's that automatic threat that well, you think about your parents and that threat has come from them quite strongly when you were little, right? This automatic threat, unless you do what I want, then we're going to have trouble here. And after a while, the child learns that I've just got to always do what they want. 
um, and then I avoid their rage. That's, that's how I avoid their rage. So I just do, 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 and eventually exhaust myself doing uh, to avoid their rage. So what you're addicted to is avoiding other people's rage. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. If avoiding the emotion that comes at, from them to you when you don't do what they want. That's what you're avoiding. And, and those emotions are all sorts of emotions, ranging from condescension right the way through to just bare violence. And you have a, a range of people around you like that who, you know, would just be condescending it towards you right the way through to somebody who would just be, like, you know, angry and really quite violent with you. Um, and if you think back at your childhood again, same pattern going on there. So, so after a while, we become so addicted to, have, to, help, to having this person not be angry with me that I'll do almost anything they want in order to prevent them from being angry with me. Right? And there's my hole. My hole is actually I need to learn that it's okay for the other person to be angry at me. I'm still not going to do what they want even when they're angry with me and even if they're condescending towards me and even if they tell me that I'm a bitch or a, or a bastard and even if they tell me that, you know, that I, you know, they're going to try to harm me and all of those kind of things, I'm still not going to do what they want. And in fact, uh, for myself, what happens with me, the more a person treats me that way, the less chance there is <laughs> of me doing what they want. For yourself, the more they treat you that way, the more chance there is of you doing what they want. Do you see? There's a big difference between those two states. So the key is to allow yourself to see how frightened you are. And in a way, um, I, I would say the underlying causal emotion is partly about how much you can't trust God, that God's going to protect you in an angry situation. And that is a really deep childhood feeling that you have, that you weren't protected in angry situations. So the key is to allow yourself to embrace that grief that's just there while I'm talking about it. That's it. And just allow yourself to embrace that grief fully and let yourself fully feel that, no, God's not going to protect me, so I've got to come up with some alternative arrangement here. And the alternative arrangement is I'll do whatever they want. That's the alternative. And would you say that that, that is really the block to Alvira um, processing her fear? Because yes. at the moment you touch into your fear and go, no, 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 no I can't do this because, excuse me, I'm not going to be protected. Whereas once you grieve this feeling that God's not going to be there, you'll have more faith. And then when you hit your fear, you'll go, it's okay, I can just surrender to this fear. And God will help me through the whole process. God will help me deal with this emotion. Um. I've actually been surprised every time I go into something, somewhere in there is God. Yeah. And the fact that I don't trust him. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I've raged at God and... But I, I, I can't... I don't know how to build that trust. Could I discuss with the whole group how to build trust in God? That would be a good thing to talk about, I think. Um, and there's a really, some really simple and direct things you can do to slowly build your trust in God and get to know God better. 